here. This is going to be fun. I have prepared nothing. I'm just going to chat with you for seven minutes. So as you got from my title, an experimental cosmologist, my topic on space is not going to be the feng shui. That's a very nice space you have over there topic. It's going to be the more James T. Kirk space the final frontier kind of topic. I'm going to be talking about essentially the universe. But to understand what I want to do, I had to really think about what I perceive as space. And I realized over my 20 years or so of, of being a cosmologist that my perception of space is distorted from, I think, the normal population's perception of space. Because it really is, uh, people think stars, they think galaxies, they think objects out there. But I don't see it that way, and I want to give you an idea of why I don't see it that way, and why I think it's, I think, differently than you do. So as a cosmologist, we study how the universe got to be the way it is. So why is the universe as we observe it? And if you were around 2,000 years ago, you might say, well, I observe space, I see stars, I see them rise, I see them set, I see the sun, it rises, it sets. And you would naturally come to the conclusion that your cosmology, that is your explanation of the universe, is that you're at the center of the universe and everything revolves around me. 1,500 years later, and a couple burnings at the stake and things like that, where people were arguing about this, they finally decided that, well, you know, maybe the sun's at the center of the universe. And it took another 500 years, and all of a sudden, well, now, really, we're not anywhere special, <laughs> okay, at all. And it's that, it's that evolution that really is, uh, is fascinating to, to cosmologists, not just in terms of just our understanding about this, but in terms of, of how we came to, to, understand, to know that. So let's think about space for, for a minute and how I look at it. So I go out and I look in, the, in my, well, my textbooks and my, and my photographs and everything, and I realize that, well, there's a lot of order to the universe. Uh, and, and it's that order and how it came into being which is important to us. So we, we see that the Earth is round, which is almost inherently ordered. It's not a just diverse thing. It's, it's actually a, an object which has, a, which has a shape. We see that the Earth goes around the sun in a circle. We see that the sun goes around the center of our galaxy in roughly a circle. We see other stars in our galaxy go around. We see galaxies orbiting our galaxies. And we take these things. This is now going from very small scale, our Earth, to hundreds of thousands of light years, to even millions of light years with galaxies orbiting ours, to billions of light years with galaxies forming into great walls and voids. And there's stuff here, there's not stuff there. And how did that object, because you can call it an object, because it's got some, it's got some you know, physical parameters to it, how did that object form in <coughs> the age of the universe? Remember, it's a billion light years across. I mean, a billion light years. It takes light a billion years to travel across these things. The universe is only 13 billion years old. How did they have time to do that? Then I go and I take the measurements that I made when I was a graduate student, which is looking at the cosmic microwave background, which is the very beginning of the universe. And I look at there, and I say, what was the universe like back then? It was very smooth. There was, no, there was almost no water at all. It was smooth to about one part in 100,000. So we take the beginning, nothing going on, and we take now, and it's incredibly ordered, and you have to ask, how did it evolve? You would not recognize our universe 13 billion years ago and from what it is now. It's like looking at a, you know, a, a, f a fetus and saying, and I'm looking at a 97-year-old man, well, 45-year-old man, and, uh, and saying, you know, are these, things, are these two things the same? And, and you know, how do they evolve? So the way we do this is we think about how the universe looked at each point in the, in, as, it, as it evolved. And what's really neat about doing cosmology is that I don't have to dig up in the ground and see some old rotted thing that then infer what it was like you know, when it was live and bouncing around. I can actually go and, and look at these objects. So if I look at a galaxy that's a billion light years away, I'm looking at light that's a billion years old. So I'm looking at that galaxy in the universe when it was only 12 billion years old. Look at one that's 7 billion light years away when the universe is only 7 billion years old. You get to see what the universe was like in its past, just by you know, building a couple million dollars, hundred million dollar telescope. But you know, you can do it. <laughs> and and so what you're doing is you're trying to make a measure of what the universe is like at several different epochs. And when you do that, you constrain how it evolved over time. And you can go into the many more than seven minute lecture about uh, about the physical parameters. But suffice it to say, we can we can basically take the universe early on, throw in a bunch of physical parameters, turn a crank, and produce the universe that we see today. And by making those measurements, we can constrain those parameters to understand, like gravity and things like that. So we do all this, and it's cute, and we're still doing it, and we, um, you know, everything I teach, I taught 10 years ago is wrong now, but that's okay. Um, I, can, I, can, I can deal with that. Uh, but, and we, we discovered a couple really interesting things. First of all, is that the matter that you're made out of, the stars and, and the stuff that you're used to, is really only comprises about 4% of the universe, you know, what, what, this, what the universe is made out of, 4%. And, of course, all that is hydrogen and helium. Forget the stuff that we are, right? We're, we're nothing. 
uh, in, you know, talk about not even special spot. We're not even special stuff in the universe. <laughs> and we realized that there was this stuff out there which uh, was really kicking us around, if you want to be a little un unkind about it, and it's called dark matter. And this dark matter is about 10 times as much dark matter around as there is us, or stuff like us around. And when we think about how the universe evolves, we don't even pay attention. So when we run a model, we say, forget the regular stuff. We want to talk about what's, what's the dark matter doing, and then we'll just get beat up and follow the dark matter as it, as it goes along. That's my vision of the universe. And so when I think about it from the early universe, which is really smooth, my vision is not this stars and galaxies out there. It's more of this coalescing goo, right? And I, and I, don't, even, I don't even bother thinking about the stars and the galaxies, just what happens to the goo? And, and, and then and, and later on, and so we in, and you watch it evolve as a, as a function of time. Now, when I do that, I see these pockets of matter, dark matter, falling into each other. And you can almost think about it as, a, uh, as bubbles, really. And where the bubbles intersect is where the dark matter has coalesced into some, into some massive object. And, we, and then what happens is, well, the regular matter happens to be around, and it gets dragged gravitationally along the path, and then you form the stars that we, that we see today. And or the what's the galaxies that we see today, and that was great. And we discovered that about you know 20, 30 years ago, well, 40 years ago, I guess. And uh, then it got really confusing, because Einstein, you remember him, 100 years ago, Einstein came up with this thing. And he w he didn't believe in the kind of universe I'm talking about. He believed in a static universe, a universe that wasn't fluid, and wasn't evolving. And he he got out of that eventually. But I mean, at the time when he came up with his theories, he did that. And he put in this, he had a uh, you know, theory of gravity, and he, he stuck, he said, I, if I put all these, uh, these stars out there, they're going to fall in on each other because I understand gravity. So I'm going to put in, you know, for lack of a better term, anti-gravity, right? Something to keep them apart so they won't fall into each other. He, he had no reason whatsoever to do this. He just did it, right? It felt like it because it, it made him more comfortable, right? Because having a dynamic universe and that's changing is a little uncomfortable, you know, philosophically, I guess, for some people. And... Uh, and people were, you know, about 10 years later, we discovered the universe is expanding and all sorts of weird things. And he said, ah, oh, that was a big mistake. Throw it out. And then a couple years later, we discovered something else. And they brought it back in, and they threw it out again, this, this extra energy thing or this extra parameter. And then about 10 years ago, we, me we made a measurement, not me personally, but friends of mine, that the universe wasn't just expanding because we have this thing called Hubble expansion. It was actually accelerating, okay? which is really disturbing philosophically when you think about it. Because if it's accelerating, uh, that means that it's never going to come back, <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's going out, and, it's, and as it, go, it goes further and further out, it's going faster and faster and getting expanding and expanding away until it can get poof into nothingness. And we measured this parameter, this, this, this stuff <coughs> that, uh, and, you know, we called it dark energy uh, for reasons mostly for funding because the Department of Energy funds it, uh, funds the research. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got to put energy into it somewhere. So the, uh, but it's really kind of a misnomer because what dark energy is is, is really this, this repulsive force, which is, which is in what's funny about it is that it's, it's the energy of space. And so when things expand more, there's more space, and therefore there's more energy. And so right now, if we count up all the energy in the universe, 70% of the, of the universe is this dark energy. About 26% about is this dark matter, and about 4% is us. And in 100 billion years, well, the dark energy will have completely subsumed us, right? We'll be, we'll be not here at all. Well, we're here, but in terms of fraction of the universe, it'll be, it'll be nothing. We'll be, we'll be nothing because most of the universe will be dark energy. And it's that evolution and understanding what's going on here which makes what I think about, I think, different from what, you know, the Star Trek episode, you know, the, the, the planets and the stars, we visit planets, and they all speak English kind of thing. It's, it's, more, it's more really thinking about the end, right? Or, you know, what is the universe going to be doing in a, in a long time? And uh, I think it's kind of fun. And uh, I think my seven minutes are probably more than up. Thank you. Oh, man. So space is all there is or all there will be.